All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Lily Hearn Foundation and I'm the programs manager at Q. Um, this is an artist talk with Myung Soo Kim and Michelle Yun on the occasion of Myung Soo's solo exhibition, Motherland, on view at Q Art Foundation through November 3rd. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. First, this event is being recorded, so please turn off your video and rename yourself using an alias if you'd like to protect your privacy. Please keep your mic muted throughout the talk to ensure the best audio experience for everyone. Live captions are available tonight. If you click on the CC closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles, you will be able to view these. Finally, there will be a short Q&A period after the discussion during which you may type questions into the chat for Myung and Michelle, or if you'd prefer to ask a question yourself, please use the raise hand function and one of us will unmute you. To give a bit of context on this exhibition, it was selected unanimously by a panel of four jurors from our 2019 open call for solo exhibitions. As part of Q's commitment to mentorship, panelists elect to work with one of the winning applicants as a curator and mentor throughout the year-long exhibition planning process. We are honored to work with Michelle Yun as the curator mentor to Myung Soo Kim. Myung Soo Kim studied architecture in his native Korea prior to coming to the United States in 2002 to pursue visual art. In 2009, he received a BFA with a concentration on sculpture, followed by an MFA from Yale University in 2011. Most recently, he participated in the 2019 Brick Biennial at Brick in Brooklyn, New York, and the Brave New World Photo Festival at the Seoul Museum of Art in Seoul, Korea. Michelle Yun is Senior Curator of Asian Contemporary Art and Associate Director of the Asia Society Triennial at Asia Society Museum, which opens on October 27th. She is responsible for overseeing the modern and contemporary exhibition program and the museum's permanent collection of contemporary art. Yun earned her MA in Modern Art and Critical Studies from Columbia University and her BA from Mount Holyoke College. She is a graduate of the Getty Leadership Institute's Executive Education Program for Museum Leaders and sits on the advisory board of the Mount Holyoke College Art Museum. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Myung Soo Kim and Michelle Yun. Thank you so much, Lily. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening with you all. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to join Myung and I. And Myung Soo, it's been such an honor to work with you, you know, this past year and a half um, on your exhibition and to really see how you've developed um, this fabulous exhibition. Hopefully everybody will have a chance to see it. Um, it opened this past Saturday and is on view through November. Um, and I'm just gonna scroll through and show, uh, as we're talking, um, a couple of installation shots. Oops, hold on one second. So, um, Myung Su, if we could just start uh, to talk a little bit about your background. Um, you know, you were born in um, Xingpung in Korea. And, you know, tell the audience a little bit about your journey, you know, when you were young, you know, did your family have a background in art? What led you to an artistic practice? Um, I was, uh, was studying in uh, architecture when I was in Korea and um, I went to the army, which was uh, uh, mandatory for all Korean men. And after I served my, uh, my military duty and I came to the States 2002 and um, I think 2004 or five then I, that's the time that I decided to uh, pursue in art my BFA and and um, I really don't know you know what's the that you know like impact moment or you know critical moment for me to you know make the decision but art has been I mean, you know, just painting, drawing, and also when I was in high school, I was really into art history. So I was at one point that I, I really wanted to become, a, you know, an art historian, but my father didn't like that idea at the beginning. And there was a, there was a big argument. And then I ended up going to an architecture school instead of going to uh, major in art history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah. <laughs> And I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, the, the audience can see just from these installation views um, that your work is very architectonic. I mean, so you can definitely see that background in architecture in your work. And I think your use of materials and kind of the meticulous craftsmanship that you dedicate to these constructions um, 
a, you know, that really um, has affinities, I think, with an architectural background. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit why you decided to come to the States to study? I mean, you know, coming from Korea, many artists also go to France or, you know, you can right. go anywhere. What made you decide to come to the States, you know, just to, to begin your um, artistic studies? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I didn't make the decision. And uh, my father made the decision for me. And then I, after military, I just um, just came to Virginia because at that time, my aunt lived in Virginia. So, and and then the, she didn't know VCU had, uh, I mean, they have strong art program. She didn't know that. And, you know, it was everything. Now that I look back, that, you know, a lot of things happened in my life that, and then many things are, I mean, were plant, weren't planned and, you know, and then it just was there and then I just did what I had to do every single step, I think. So we, I didn't plan to be an artist when I came to the state that there was a... I see. Yeah. And um, when you began studying art here in the States, you started as a sculptor, is that right? right. Mm -hmm. You use a lot of photography in right. your work also. Mm -hmm. So did you also study photography or was that something that you became more self-trained in as you, um, you know, began to create these um, sculptural installations? How did you decide to merge um, your photographic practice with the sculptural practice? And, and do you see them as two separate elements to your practice or do you see it as one kind of seamless, um, you know, vehicle to mm -hmm. create your vision? Um, yeah, it's uh, photography has been uh, one of the, you know, very important element in my work and, and that goes for same as, um, you know, other, you know, elements, you know, um, such as, you know, woodworking or, you know, um, it, it's basically it's the same. It's one of the things that I could do. And um, I really didn't see it, you know, separately. It's like something that I do. And then it's just, you know, picture sometimes, you know, I, I take many, many pictures and then every trip that I make, you know, I take thousands, thousands of pictures. And then one thing I, that I do like almost every day is that, you know, exploring my external hard drive and then try to, see what picture I can use for my work. And sometimes, you know, some picture that I really don't like it right after I see it, but sometimes, you know, it takes a couple of years or a couple of months, couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So it, taking picture and then, you know, discovering pictures, it, it's a totally different thing. So to me, um, for me that the pictures are, you know, it's like, it's the same as, uh, same as MDF, same as, same as wood, same as a uh, brass that I use. And, you know, that I it's very interesting you make that distinction between taking the picture and then later on rediscovering the picture almost as you're going through it in your files and you know Roland Barthes um, the French theorist had this um, term that he coined called punctum which meant mm -hmm. the thing in a photograph that captures your eye right. and so for you in your works is there a punctum or is there something that you find consistently when you're going back and you're, well, either when you're taking the photograph, like is there a certain image or a certain kind of perspective that really um, captures your eye more than others or that draws you to take it? Or do you just kind of throughout your day, is it more kind of um, almost a uh, reflexive activity of just kind of shooting and documenting your day and, and then conversely when you go back and look through your files do you find that there's any kind of consistency to what you find that re-engages you at that later date um i don't carry camera all the time i mean especially these days you know um you know iphone or you know your smartphone takes a really good picture and um but uh most of my picture, I think um, they're, you know, um, the big body of my picture, it's, it's about a landscape, mm -hmm. landscape that are um, sometimes empty or sometimes there are people in it or there's a tree, sometimes there's snow or, you know, sometimes a landscape of um, really extreme condition, like a high, like, you know, 5,000 meter high altitude, you know, and like, you know, Bolivian in Altiplano or many um, different places. I mean, it's like places that are, you know, I have to bring my camera 
you know, even if I don't want to take picture because, you know, the place itself has a very special or very exotic, um, you know, you know, circumstances. So, um, and then many time I take picture and because I just have to take picture, you know, and then I bring back to my studio and, and um, I think it's the same as, it goes same as, uh, you know, my STEM collection, you know, I, I, I was very passionate about collecting stems when I was, when I was a child, like nine and 10, and I totally forgot about, you know, whole collection. And then it took me almost like 20 years to rediscover them. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, the pictures, you know, stems, I think it, they're just basically the same. So I, I, I mean, I have to say, I'm, I'm very passionate about taking pictures and then I want to take better pictures, but that's like kind of, you know, fundamental things, but um, they're always on an, an disappointment and about my, my technique or, you know, and when I see someone else, you know, taking better picture. And so there's a, and then also I never studied photography and, and, and I know how people are very competitive and then technically there are very highly trained people out there. And, and I think there is a little, you know, little bit of myself that think that, you know, my pictures, you know, maybe not strong enough. And then maybe it can be used as, as one of the work, you know, in my element in my sculpture, but I never consider them as a, as a, you know, picture, picture, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting what you said just now, you think about, you know, the same way that you're thinking about these kind of expansive geographies, you know, like if you look in this installation shot that I have on the screen, you know, yeah. you have this, um, in your uh, Untitled Landscapes, High and Dry, which is the image on the left, the brown landscape, you know, it's this kind of expanse and it's almost an abstraction of, yeah. of the land. And then, you know, on the right, you have one of your Olympic um, collages. And so, again, thinking about the stands and thinking about kind of these bridging these expanses of both geographical distance, but also chronological distance. Um, right. And I think, you know, in your artistic statement in the catalog that accompanied this um, exhibition, you had a really interesting quote that I will read. Um, you say that your practice identifies connections between personal narratives and geopolitical events as a study of the phenomenon of synchronicity. And I know in our past discussions, you've talked a lot about the um, powerful influence or kind of your focus on um, this idea of synchronicity in your in your larger practice right. and mm -hmm. certainly within this body mm -hmm. of work. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit for our audience and explain what that means in relation to to your practice and to your to your perspective on the world. So um, um so synchronicity is that something that I've been really thinking. I mean things are keep happening, you know, it happened and, you know, and some, sometimes, you know, I, you know, realized, oh yeah, this thing happened. And then sometimes, but, you know, I recognize, you know, this thing is right there. And then, you know, if I had, uh, I think uh, for me that, you know, making art is that the creating a narrative, putting, you know, connecting two dots, you know, it's like constellation, you know, we make constellation based on our, you know, fantasy about, you know, stars that we never visited. And then we can only see, and then we, you know, you know, connecting that together, and then making a story. I think of my art, um, so that you know, it's just like just like that. Um, maybe like thinking about you know, 1988 in you know, Olympics, and thinking about my memory with that you know particular event, and thinking about you know political situation. At that time, I didn't know anything about political situation because I was too young. But now that I know that what happened back then, and so I'm trying to kind of parallelize, I mean, those two, two different timelines in my work that, so that, you know, people can, you know, kind of like, you know, maybe almost like, you know, time traveling back and forth. And so also, you know, I feel like I'm time traveling too, you know, it's like, it's almost like I'm mirroring myself, you know, my childhood. And then, you know, I'm like, now that I'm, you know, old enough to understand what really happened and you know what was uh, going on in Korean society at that time you know with uh, the violence and sports was it being used as a you know government agenda and you know stuff like this. Sure I mean and so maybe that can segue into this idea of thinking about images and especially photographs I mean when you think about a photograph right. mm -hmm. 
think about it as a documentation of a yeah. mm -hmm. time and that it kind of is the facts, but yeah. in, mm -hmm. in reality, it's very subjective and it really depends not only on the person, you know, the perspective and the intentions of the person who's taking the photograph mm -hmm. and, you know, cropping it and, you know, making the composition mm -hmm. um, to suit their vision, but also the person who is, you know, um, the, who is receiving the image and right. mm -hmm. testing it and from their perspective. And I think, you know, your focus on mm -hmm. these Olympic commemorative stamps, which as you rightly say, were used for propagandic purposes mm -hmm. um, to really show kind of Korean might and power and strength um, and using these sports as, you know, and, and culture as kind of a form of soft power, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, maybe we can think a little bit of your younger self at the age of yeah. eight when you yeah. started collecting these, like, mm -hmm. what did that symbolize to you? And then kind of thinking now, um, you know, as a diasporic artist, mm -hmm. you know, looking back and revisiting these, like how that belief or understanding kind of shifted and mm -hmm. what, you know, how that translated especially looking at these two works that are on on the screen right now as as case studies so um i i tried to just you know recall you know what i was thinking but it was it was it's been well, almost you know 25 years old i mean almost like 30 years ago and i really don't know what i was thinking and but i all i can think i mean there's a but there's a little fragment you know in my childhood memory that and then, you know, little story that, you know, you know, it's kind of like, you know, telling me that, you know, how passionate I was, you know, in, in terms of, you know, collecting stamps. I was even stealing, you know, my neighbor's, you know, stamp, and then I got caught and it was, I was in a bit of trouble, but at then, but it's, you know, it's like, I was, I don't know why, but I was extremely passionate collecting stamps and I really had um, many, many stamps. I was, I was very, very surprised when I, my, when my mom brought back uh, to the state like a couple years ago and it w I was very shocked that you know, I probably couldn't do that you know right now because you know and then so I was only like eight ten you know really young and so I was really passionate but I think it, there is some sort of sense of you know innocence mm -hmm. and uh, just being really you know pure and innocent you know as a, as a human being little human and just keep collecting stamps you know every day and then trying to find a way to collect more and yeah I don't really probably I didn't really think about anything about you know actual Olympics actual sports game you know I, I probably just you know wanted to have more and more you know just like and how did you then you know because it sounds like you had hundreds or thousands of stamps yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um you know looking in in developing this body of work, what was your criteria for selecting the imagery? Um, you know, maybe we can look at these two specific yeah, works mm -hmm. and walk us through your process a little mm -hmm. bit of the meaning behind these images, yeah, mm -hmm. the way that they're cropped, or you know how they um, are fragmented in extreme competition plots yeah, mm -hmm. on the right. Um, and so, kind of thinking a little bit about how you deconstructed these and what yeah. that means to you at this moment in time. Um, I mean, I can't stop thinking about, you know, violence when I see them. I mean, sports, it, it's not, you know, it's, it's, there's a competition. I mean, you know, people are competing for, um, you know, better, you know, you know, results. But um, <clears throat> I think there's a bottom line is that there is a sense of, you know, violence and, and the violence that, you know, I want to become, you know, you know, overcome, you know, you know, opponents and um, and I, I pick um, the images that are, you know, like I guess you know most violence, mm -hmm. violent image, you know, and um, and then trying to deconstruct and you know and creating making you know you know more aggressive. I think mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, kind of diffuse that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. I mean, and and thinking about that in a nation state level i mean are you thinking about diffusing um political mm -hmm. disagreements or kind of political turmoil between countries as you're thinking about this or not so much um no no that's not so much i mean you know mm -hmm. 
But it, 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 it's not between countries. I think it's, uh, it happens uh, internally. So, you know, when nationalism works, you know, when people think that the, um, they are in, in very fragile, you know, condition, you know, so they're like very weak. And then, then that's a time that, you know, the nationalism works. And so I think the sports is very easy to, I mean, probably not so, I mean, probably, you know, still very effective in a way to kind of like unify, you know, the country. Like, you know, if you look at the um, World Cup game, you know, people go crazy. I mean, they're like, you know, really, really crazy. And, and, but, but back in the days, I think in the 1980s and, you know, Olympic was uh, one of the big, big, you know, events that, you know, they can. Rallies the nation yeah. together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and especially like in the past couple of years and, you know, and the nationalism, you know, it's, it's been rising in this nation too, you know, and, and it's like, so make, you know, great America great again is that the, um, that's the, the basic model for the, um, you know, nationalism, you know, we, we need to make this country better. I mean, it's, it's already better and then make it better. And, and um, so, um, so it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, that's what, you know, what Korean government was saying, you know, back in 80s, you know, we need to make, you know, country better. And then now that, you know, we're hearing it, so. I mean, because you would think that Ideally, it would be a great equalizer, right? It's like bringing people together. It kind of equalizes everybody. But then, when in actual fact, it it divide. It's very divisive, and it really kind of separates people and makes them choose sides, or you know, makes them feel this difference against. Um, well, and I think it's very interesting too. You have this kind of lifelong. Yeah. Mm -hmm of collecting you know and and i know in past conversations we talked about your uncle who was a collector of of kind of um communist memorabilia oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and just kind of thinking about this idea of synchronicity thinking about memory thinking about mm -hmm. cosmology and mm -hmm. idea of collecting memories or collecting ideas or kind mm -hmm. of actions through time mm -hmm. or through space and um it's just so fascinating. I mean, and I think the way that you make these constructions, they're very poetic, um, but also a little surreal, you know? I think you are not quite sure what's real and what's artifice mm -hmm. or, you know, kind of, um, you know, some of the surfaces that you use are so meticulous, you know, the way that you are crafting the wood or here in this landscape with two bears, I think that's graphite, right, on the top yeah. left. Bottom. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's just so meticulously handled, it's hard to know what it actually is, you know, and when you think about graphite as um, material, like a mineral, it's like a timeless kind of geological artifact in a way, but then it's also something that's very practical, you know, like you use graphite to write with. I mean, it, so there's so many different layers of meaning mm -hmm. and context, and I, you know, I wonder if you could talk about these associations and if you feel that there is an element of the surreal in your in your work um, and how you would like to make these disparate kind of constellations come together to make a right. whole image. I mean, when you um, look at the star and then when you think about, you know, Greek, you know, mythology and, you know, there's always a story about, you know, you know, like, you know, you know, constellation and, and uh, I mean, that so um, I was thinking about, you know, you know, as, as, as an artist, you know, what I'm trying to do is that um, for me that um, the, so I think that, you know, telling you the extremely sad story in a beautiful way, I think that's, that's the art that I'm trying to do. And then that's the same, equal same with, um, um, you know, all the story with a uh, constellation that you you know if you read it and then there's no happy ending it's it's all oh, people die you know it's just it's, uh, there's a, you know it's like but you know it, it's people still read you know um you know like um it's all those greek you know mythologies that because it's it's extremely well you know written and so um i mean uh, so i i wanted to you know I mean, if for some reason, when I look back, you know, certain time that it's, it's like, I was thinking about, you know, okay, okay, there is a Voyager 
two that was you know space probe that you know um, was launched like 19 like 76 or something and it kept you know traveling traveling now it's in interstellar and then when i just think about that sort of thing it just makes me so sad and then something's very extremely romantic but it's so romantic that makes me sad so um i'm i'm, I'm thinking about that sort of uh, little things that story and with uh sure. the work i make you know and trying to um you know having this you know this the you know picture of you know nice sky and graphite graphite is a uh, material that i really like and because it, it kind of represents you know you compress the time you know and but also we use it it's basic um you know stuff for them when i make drawing you know writing and also there is a little you know elements the wood the wood that i found and so I wanted to create, I guess, you know, my own constellation with, with this particular piece. Yeah, I mean, and I love how also too with, you know, not only this work, but many of the other works yeah, yeah. I've seen, like there are these little windows or these little, yeah. little like, mm -hmm. vortex that you can mm -hmm. go into this other world, you know? Yeah. And, but also these fragments, like a fleeting memory that you have from the past that you, you know, you have a receptacle for it somewhere in your mind and you try to put these disparate ideas together to make this whole. Um, and sometimes, you know, they are a little disjointed, but they're, it's, it's very poignant, I think. Um, yeah. And there's like a wonderful ethereal quality to to so much of your work. I mean, and you know, this is another really great example entitled Landscapes High and Dry, which we referred to a few minutes ago, but you can just see it much more clearly. I mean, you know, it's this expansive land mass that you, um, you know, it's, it's almost like it's the micro and the macro all together because it's expansive, but then it almost looks like you're looking at a very small concentrated like you don't know if you're looking at the detail of a rock or if you're looking at like thousands of miles of acreage um and just kind of the layering that you do the physical layering of the surface you know is like thinking about these strata of memory or strata mm -hmm. of the earth or you know just um peeling back these onion layers is so wonderful um and i and i would be interested if you could just expand a little bit about this idea of like layering and, mm -hmm. and the shapes that you use. I mean, oftentimes you use geometric mm -hmm. shapes in your compositions where right. you know, this interesting juxtaposition between the very organic mm -hmm. natural materials or imagery like you see here in these more um, geometric, you know, symmetrical elements that balance it out. Yeah, I, um, I use uh, many, I mean, circles many times and then you know layering them together so um it's circles set so I, i'm i'm i really like um you know telescopes and also i do love you know collecting you know camera lenses and so the the lenses has a you know, perfect circle and then it circles that you know has a power to you know bring you know you know the landscape or you know object whatever really far that right in front of you so it, it's got like you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it has a power. And then I wanted to layering them and then, you know, so wanted to create something that is very, very, you know, emphasizing, you know, how much I can flatten these pictures, you know, or this landscape. So basically, I mean, there's a, it's not, I'm not flattening anything, but, you know, I wanted to create something that the, the you know, maybe in this little, you know, um, you know, within in this uh, this frame that I wanted to create something that, you know, this this create my my fantasy about my um, I mean, you know, you know, flattening landscape, you know, in my picture. Mm -hmm. So just keep printing same thing over and over again, and put, put you know, glue them, and then layering them, you know, in multiple layers, and so that it can be like fragment, but at the same time, you know. You, you don't know if it's um, this spot or if it's that spot, you know, it, there's a, or, you know, you can, so I'm trying to, yeah, dilute the sense of, you know, distance, almost like, you know. Sure. I mean, and I, I would like to talk a little bit about 
your travels because when we first started working together, you know, we were talking about this show and you had all these trips, you know, these shooting trips planned to yeah. material for your show. And obviously with the pandemic, it made it impossible right. to go anywhere really. Right. Um, you know, maybe I don't even know if, you know, going to the studio was probably challenging in the beginning. And I wonder just because, you know, it's the situation everybody's in, you know, how the pandemic changed your working practice at all, or, you know, how that affected the way that this project came together. Because I think when you first started thinking about this show, it may have very different right. ideas in the beginning than, you know, um, what was able to happen. But I think, you know, but sometimes when things that, like that happen, it's wonderful surprises. So I'm just curious, how this affected uh, the process? I I was um, so I was supposed to make a trip to Utah uh, back in March, but I had to cancel it because you know the, the pandemic happened and we didn't know that how it it was you know it's gonna get this bad. But and at the time, so yeah, I didn't go to Utah, and um, but I feel like. But you know, I think it in a good way that you know I get to spend more time in my studio, and then I've um, discovered you know many other uh, way, I mean material like a new um, you know MDF, and also I've been spending you know more time with my um, you know CNC cutting. Mm -hmm. So I think it turns out you know productive way. That I mean I I I still want to go to, go back. I mean go make the tree one more time, but um, yeah. Sure, I mean, and has it, mm -hmm. has it focused your ideas in a different direction that you're excited to explore? I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. more of the construction with the CNC cutter yeah. or with the building of these objects, um, you know, and, and do you think that that will push, ultimately push your work in a different direction? Um, I mean, this is a great example, you know, when we were talking, we, I think the Mount, ha Mount St. Helens um, mm -hmm. picture was supposed to be more of a 2D compositional. Right, and, yeah. Like, this wonderful construction, um, you know, that's so multidimensional. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like definitely because of the pandemic, you know, I get to spend more time in my studio myself. And then also um, because of the pandemic and my wife and um, my uh, kids, you know, they, they're staying in Korea. So I get to uh, spend more time myself, uh, you know, with my projects. So, so this, this construction that it, it takes really, really long time to, you know, finish it. And then, um, yeah, so it, it's uh, definitely, there's a yeah, pandemic, I mean, I wouldn't say pandemic helped me to finish the project, but it kind of detoured me in a way that I I really didn't think, I mean, because, you know, at, when I had a studio visit with you back in like February and early March, that I didn't know um, that I would be using, you know, CNC so much and then I'll be using this particular, you know, material at that time. But um, so I, yeah, so pandemic, they toured me. They kind of pushed you in a yeah, new yeah, it's in a weird direction, but you know, it ended up, yeah, it's good, you know, in a good way, yeah. No, I think, I agree. I mean, I think that, yeah. you know, it really, the objects that you yeah. create are so intriguing and so yeah. complex, I think. And, you know, I mean, we can move on to this installation here, this sculpture of Mount St. Helens, 1980. Um, you know, I think it's just so complex on so many levels. I mean, on the left, you see an aerial view and a three quarter view on the right hand side. Um, but Mount St. Helens is referring again to your biography. You know, when we first started this conversation, we talked about your birth in 1980 and, you know, coincidentally Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. And I mean, if you could just share with the audience um, the anecdote um, of, you know, your birth with them to give a little context of the significance of Mount St. Helens. Um, uh, so, so my mom was um, saying that um, she had a really nice breezy summer in 1980 because, you know, she had a child, you know, which was me and, you know, back in um, 1980 March. And so she, it was just like 
just she was saying that oh yeah you're born and then the summer that the year that you're born was really nice and probably because of you and you know it's kind of like you know almost like you know it's she just she just I mean she you were just you know she told me many times that story and then I we didn't know anything about Mount St. Helen back then and I recently one of my um, friends um, she's uh, actually writing a film script and then she was telling me about Mount St. Helens and um, and and I thought that that's pretty interesting because Mount St. Helen, I thought that that's the uh, same name as, uh, you know, St. Helena, the little island one in, um, where Napoleon died. So, so I, one thing that I do is, uh, you know, just Google map, just, you know, going, just, you know, to the, looking at the, you know, the area view of uh, just, you know, remote islands and just thinking about, you know, if you're there and then what would you, if I'm there and then what would I feel, you know, just, you know, kind of you know, fantasizing stuff like that. So that Mount uh, St. Helena was the one of the island that I was thinking, but now I, so that I Googled the name and so I, you know, found out that, oh, it's not Mount St. It's not St. Helena, it's Mount St. Helen, one in Washington state. And, and then I researched more and then I realized that actually it did impact, um, you know, enter Northern Hemisphere at the summer. So summer was a little cooler than, you know, average. And so, so when I, found out that I call my mom and then ask them, oh, did you know about, you know, this gigantic volcanic eruption? And then she didn't know anything about it. So, so it's kind of, it was really fun, you know, funny moment that, you know, I, yeah, she kept saying that story many, many times when I was young. And now that I know that the, re the actual reason why she was saying that it wasn't me, it was because, you know, the volcanic eruption. And so I always wanted to make, um, you know, a sculpture about that that memory and that you know story yeah i mean and it ties again so beautifully with this idea of synchronicity yeah. right and your yeah. personal biography but then kind of how that is connected to larger world events and right. mm -hmm. way then thinking more holistically how we're all connected to each other you know and yeah. we may think is a very discreet or kind of isolated mm -hmm event or action is something that actually reverberates, um, you know, exponentially um, mm -hmm. across the world in some ways. I mean, when you think about the butterfly effect, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. um, theory or whatever, that, but it's, I really think that that's such a beautiful element of your practice mm -hmm. and your way of thinking that, you know, there is this interconnectedness, whether mm -hmm. we realize it or not. And, um, you know, if you just look a little harder or a little mm -hmm. more carefully, then you'll see that connection. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I also really love about your work is it really f engages you to look more carefully. You know, it, there's like these little slippages. And so what might seem very pedestrian or kind of something that's recognizable at first, then mm -hmm. when you look again, it's a little more mysterious and it really mm -hmm. kind of makes you think and, um, makes you, I guess, reassess your definitions or understandings of things. So I think uh, it's really successful in that way. And I think it's such a cohesive body of work. Um, so I really hope that everybody who's uh, with us tonight will have a chance to go see the exhibition. Or if you have seen it, you know, after hearing Myung Su um, share his thoughts about it, if, you know, you go revisit the exhibition um, and, you know, look at it with fresh eyes. So I think maybe at this point, Myung Su, unless you have anything else you'd like to add, we can um, go to some questions. Um, yeah. Let's see, let me look at the chat. I think there are, let's see, some questions. Sorry, everybody, let me just take a look. Um, I think there are more comments than questions. If anybody has a question, feel free to type it in. Um, oh, somebody asked if they also collect stamps and they were wondering if they can send some to you as new inspiration. Would you be open to that, Myung Su? <laughs> sure, I mean, yeah. I yeah. Mean, you could probably send them through the Q Foundation, right? Yeah. You drop yeah. them off okay. there. And It'll be very Amazing, yeah. Yeah, get them from send them. Great, she they said perfect. Um, let's see, any other questions that people would like to 
um, to ask Myung Su about the work that we've seen or about his larger practice. Um, let's see this. I, you know, I'm curious, Myung Su, you, when we were preparing for this conversation, you had a very interesting point about your experience in the military and kind of having that be this transition period between your life in Korea and your life in the States and kind of the beginning of your artistic life. And I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit for the audience, because I thought it was really quite fascinating in relation to what we've been talking about. So, um, um, there's quite some moments in the past, uh, especially past like 10 years, and, you know, I find, I found myself that, you know, I'm really sort of um, dull at violence. I mean, even like a drinking, you know, I mean, it's like many things. It's like, there's a lot of things that um, I, you know, moment that, you know, I find, found myself that, you know, I'm really, really um, not really sensitive, you know, I'm very insensitive of violence. I mean, something that this is not really, this is very, you know, you know, violent, violent move, but, you know, I didn't realize, you know, it's like, you know, but then I think um, there's a major reason is that, you know, I, my military experience and then it, it's kind of like, you know, made me really, really insensitive about, you know, um, something just being, you know, violent. And, and then, but the problem was that right after discharge from the military was, which was like 19, I mean, 2000 May, 2002 May. And then I came to the state 2002 June. So, and then since then, you know, it's been like almost 18 years. And um, I think there is a big like a gap between, you know, the time that I was in Korea and then time that I spent in the United States. So I think that's the, one of the big reason that for me to look back my childhood memory more. And why? More objectively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess another question, thinking about, you know, the direction going forward, I mean, huh? do you have ideas of the next project that you'd like to do? Do you, would you like to continue um, thinking about the stamps and thinking about your childhood and digging deeper into that period of time um, as inspiration or, you know, are you, are there new directions that you think you would like to take your work next? Oh uh, yeah, I, uh, um, I'm thinking about my next project that um, I wanted to, um, I mean, there are a few things that I wanted to, you know, include this show, but I just couldn't physically, you know, wasn't able to deliver on time or, you know, there's uh, just, yeah. So, I mean, I, there's a thing that I want to do, you know, do, next and I'm hoping to maybe I'll develop much bigger, you know, sculpture with, um, you know, many CNC, you know, part involved. And, and it's kind of weird, you know, happy that I have that, you know, I, I always, if I can, there, if, if so, it's kind of stupid. And I don't any, I don't make any plan for my sculptures, but I always make plan to disassemble and then find a way to, you know, um, store them for a long time. So um, it's, uh, I think it's very, sometimes it's, uh, it's a good habit, but sometimes it's really bad habits in, you know, for. Well, that's always the perpetual artist dilemma. Like what do you do <laughs> yeah. after you can make it right? It's a, it's an unfortunate pragmatic uh, side. I mean, it's like a box, you know, you know, if there's a way to fold it and the word fold it back, you know, and, and, um, so I want to create really big installation, you know, if I have chance, you know, by parts by parts. So that's, um, um, that's so good. like a little sculpture, but you know, it's like, you know, big, big scale, you know. Great. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question from somebody in the audience. Yeah. Um, they'd like to hear more about your interest in Southwestern landscapes and sites such as the Salton Sea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how those landscapes um, tie in with the other bodies of work that are in this show at Q. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always interested in seeing, like, you know, um, Salton Sea is, uh, it's, it's a man-made, um, 
you know, gigantic lake in Southern California. And, and um, so, so I was interested in many, many lakes. So over, you know, Eurasia, and there was a one sea that called RRC that are, is nearly that now. And I'm always interested in, interested in to um, study and research about um, things that we, you know, did and they were doing to our nature and and that's kind of like, you know making big scar on the planets and and I think that's also there's a big you know sense of you know violence and we, I mean we've been as as a as a civilization we've been collecting because you know we've been collecting all the information nowadays and we've been collecting many things from nature and then we've been you know you know using it to for us and for the civilization and so I think that's a that's a part of um it's like it's in human nature, you know, it's collecting something. And then as, as a, you know, act of collecting and we always ended up, you know, damaging it. So I think there's a big sense of, you know, violence, you know, and so certain season was the thing that I was really interested in to visit because, you know, it's the, it's, 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 a, it's unbelievably big lake that has an extremely smelly and the extremely, I mean, I don't know, I, I never been into the, the water, but there are people, I saw people swimming there, but it's like, Incredible that there's a, all you know, tons of tons of fish, dead fishes around there, and then but, and um, <laughs> so, I I just couldn't believe that how how they just you know just let this be like this you know, and it was like, so I really wanted to see myself you know and and then I made a trip there and. I really do like yeah, that yeah. connection that you made with this idea of violence against mm -hmm. the landscape. Yeah. about the violence that you are seeing retrospectively right. the sports mm -hmm. and the Olympics, you know, and kind of this yeah. um, cross-national competition. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that is a really thoughtful connection between the two that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily immediately make that connection. Um, I so mean, the landscape is the, one of the big, 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 you know, um, you know, gigantic, um, you know, you know, that can, you know, hold, you know, you know, much violence that from in us. So I think that the violence is one thing that is very, you know, important element in my work. And then landscape is one thing that it, there, there's a lot, many, many, you know, violent, much violence in, in the landscape, but it just doesn't, you know, show there. So I think that's the one thing that I'm really, you know, being into, you know, about the landscapes, especially, um, Utah and Arizona, if you, um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, we, especially in the past couple of years, and then, you know, they're trying to, um, you know, legalize, you know, the coal mining and, you know, developing there. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah, I think I see, you know, much violence there, and then, and that's what it makes me, um, you know, interested in those in landscapes. Mm. Yeah. I mean, kind of connected to landscape, thinking about, I mean, um, a question somebody was asking about talismans in your work, um, which is, I think, something that kind of goes across yeah. the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, thinking about elements of body parts or teeth or bones or, you know, we were looking, talking yeah. about the wood, the driftwood. Um, and so this person was curious about how these more intimate objects mm -hmm. tie the narrative of state control and manufactured landscapes, both yeah. national and theoretical and geographic. Mm -hmm. And how did these narratives of nationalism affect the bodies of the individuals who are being fed these ideas and promises? And so does that play into your ideas when you're constructing these um, narratives, these visual narratives? Yeah, so, um, so let's say there's a big landscape and there's, um, there's one person standing and then maybe two people standing and then they're like doing, you know, maybe camping there. And then I take picture with that big landscape and they're on a part of a landscape. So I think the little, you know, talisman or little, you know, object that I cast or, you know, I painted or, you know, collect that that's kind of thing that I, when I creating a work and then I, to me that, you know, I'm creating a, a, on a landscape and then there are the part of landscape there are there. So sometimes it could be uh, from my, um, you know, my personal, you know, um, memorabilia or, you know, my, you know, something that are, you know, I collected for no reason. And then I just kept it for no reason for a very long time. Nowadays has some, 
it's meaningful and then <laughs> enough to make a more than castle, you know, plus and then paint it. So it's it's like um so um yeah it, it's it I'm creating a landscape. I think that's the kind of you know bottom line of my work and then um um all the little object there it's um it's uh it's yeah it's part of a landscape. It could be a, it could be you know also it could be you know animal it could be a tree it could be a house there you know mm -hmm. so um yeah great and um i guess thinking a little bit again to your practice and the studio practice somebody was asking mm -hmm. you know if you have any routines that you have or processes when you start working in the studio um or kind of you know maybe rituals and i was also curious mm -hmm. you know are, it in the creation of this specific body of work was there specific books that you were reading or um, music that you would listen to as you're creating the work? Um, um, do you have any thoughts on that? So, <laughs> so um, I, I used to listen to a lot of different musics, but nowadays I, I'm really, I mean, I realized that, you know, I'm only listening um, like classical music and, and then it kind of defines that, you know, what I do, because, you know, now one time at some point you know i i admit myself that you know i'm i'm extremely formalist you know i i like to make stuff and then you know it has to be you know nice and you know and angled then you know it's uh you know there's a corners need to be sharp then and all the things that um and then realize that i i'm really uh into um um like you know like a baroque music and bach or you know um it, it, yeah, it's like every morning I, I, I do the, I listen same, same music. I, maybe I'm like, a, there's a, one pianist, pianist and I really, you know, listening for like past 10 years and, and Murray Pariah and then his uh, Bach is like, you know, one thing that it gives me, um, it, it's, yeah, it, it's not the music that you'd listen, you know, while you're doing all the woodworking, but yeah, I, I yeah, it's, um, that's, yeah, supports you and it kind of carries you through. yeah yeah it's like that the old that you know the, the rhythm then it yeah it makes me really it gives me power to focus mm -hmm. wonderful yeah. well thank you so much myung Su. this was a wonderful conversation and thank you all for spending time with us uh, i'm going to turn over the um the mic i guess as it were to lily for as <laughs> closing remarks but thank you so thank much you. thank you so much thank you yeah. yeah, I'm going to keep this brief, but I just also wanted to say thank you so much. Thank you to Myung and Michelle for your work on this exhibition, for your flexibility with rescheduling due to the pandemic. Uh, the show is beautiful and it's been such an honor to work with both of you. Uh, and for you. everyone else who has not been able to see the show yet, um, please do come visit us. We are open, the show's open until November 3rd, we're, and we are open Wednesday through Saturday from noon to 6 p.m. Uh, we would love to have you in our space and um, yeah, we, we're so happy to be open again and be able to welcome people into our space. So thanks everyone for your work. Thanks for attending and take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here this evening. Thank you.